Subway goes antibiotic free and farmers and ranchers are frustrated. We'll have your reactions on this controversial topic. Plus, it could be a tool to take the emotion out of where to build livestock operations. More on the state's livestock matrix. And a harvest update, including the elevator's point of view during this busy season. It's time to grow. Big news in the world of meat production. Subway announced a plan to go antibiotic free for beef and pork. The company expects the full transition to happen by 2025. They expect to have chicken raised without antibiotics in all 27,000 stores by the end of next year. The move is part of a larger trend among restaurants and food manufacturers to offer what they consider healthier fare. This has sparked outrage from many producers who say meat is already free of antibiotics. We heard from several of you who weighed in on Facebook and Twitter. From Darren, withholding antibiotics is inhumane. Casey on Twitter says pressure from extreme food activists, that is food babe, not consumer demand, fueled this ag destructive marketing ploy. Mark questions Subway when the company says this is high quality and economical. He writes, as a professional hog producers for the last 30 years, Going antibiotic free will do just the opposite, lower quality and raise cost. Well, the frustrating thing with the subway announcement is the fact that they have said uh, we're going to transition to zero antibiotics being used. And it's one thing if you say you want to limit antibiotic usage or take a non therapeutic uh, antibiotics out of feed. We're already transitioning that way. But to say zero antibiotics uh, just isn't a good, sustainable, workable situation for livestock. A recent effort to strengthen beef trade with a trip to Hong Kong, Nebraska Ag Director Greg Ibaugh will head out this week, along with cattle producer from Edgar Don Caldwell. Ibaugh says Hong Kong is a pathway to the Chinese marketplace and is hopeful at some point China will lift its ban on U.S. beef exports. Ibaugh says the food market, the export market, is getting tight. And it's important to stay aggressive in promoting Nebraska meat. Last year, Hong Kong was the second larger importer of Nebraska beef, more than $239 million worth. Now, weather has been a nearly perfect time right now here for harvest as rains, though late in the week, slowed things down just a little bit. But we're likely past that halfway mark on corn. USDA will release new numbers in a few days. But as for the last check that we have, Nebraska was 40% complete on the corn harvest. Most of that corn rating good and excellent. Sorghum harvest still underway and soybeans are just about wrapped up, 80% harvested. USDA says virtually all winter wheat has been planted. Mom, cook, driver, farm families wear many hats during the harvest season. And Janelle Lobb says her husband, Brian, runs the show as three generations farms together. She's not just a farm wife, though. She's an active farmer as well, driving the grain cart and while also keeping the crew fed in the field. Well, the other day, Brian's mom uh, brought us hamburgers fresh off the grill, so that was uh, definitely a favorite. Sometimes it's pizza, sometimes it's... Uh, pork loin from uh, from Becca's pigs that she raised this summer. It just depends on what's in the fridge and who has time to do what. USDA statistics show 97% of farms are family farms. Often family members come back just to take a ride in the combine. We'd love to see your multi-generational harvest photos as well. You can share them with us on Facebook and Twitter. When you're used to antique machinery, a modern combine seems like a real monster. That's what the staff at the Nebraska Prairie Museum near Holdridge thought. So the museum had a few acres of soybeans that needed to be cut. Now, while they do have farm equipment, it's the antique variety. So they flagged down a farmer who was working in the area. Shane Westcott was more than happy to help, and they say that he got the job done in no time. Many producers can expect some mail from the government. Crop and hay producers will get a USDA questionnaire. They are collecting data to determine county level figures for acres yield and production. USDA officials say that information has a direct impact on farmers. For example, it can help determine when to make crop loss insurance payments. USDA says all responses are completely confidential. 
It is National Co-op Month, a time to remember the importance of cooperatives, not just in agriculture, but for the overall economy. For the local community, they create jobs. They're lasting jobs. These co-ops have been around for a long time. A lot of people in the local community work for the uh, farmer co-ops. Co-ops are organizations owned and run jointly by its members who share profits or benefits. Farmer co-ops were started to give members access to affordable seed equipment, as well as a way to market their products. Reynolds says today, farmer co-ops look for the best and newest ways to serve their members. Providing information on agronomy, the latest uh, you know, geopositioning technologies, they're providing all those services, things that the, that the individual farmer may not be able to afford. In addition to farmer co-ops, there are grocery co-ops, financial co-ops, among others. U.S. co-op business sector generates more than $650 billion in annual sales and accounts for more than 200 million jobs. Nebraska lawmakers say ConAgra's job cuts and their move from Omaha to Chicago is not likely to cause big changes to tax policies for the state. The company move has some calling for new tax reform, but some senators say ConAgra's relocation decision was less about those incentives and more about their needs to consolidate. So they plan to keep their focus on Nebraska's property taxes when the unicameral reconvenes. Meanwhile, the director of the now up and running Nebraska Innovation Campus says he is not worried about the impact the food company's decision will have on their partnership. Dan Duncan says they met with top ConAgra executives after the announcement and the company reaffirmed their commitment to being a part of Innovation Campus. It's always a concern when companies have major changes um, and that's just part of, of the process with any company. It's part of the process within the university when faculty move to a different place and you, they have uh, industry partners. Well, flying a drone could get a little harder. The government is set to announce new regulations for drone owners across the country. One expected rule, those operating the gadgets need to register the device. It's the latest move to regulate an exploding market in unmanned aircraft. Officials saying some of those drones posing real danger in the air and on the ground. The FAA will announce their plans later on and an estimated 500,000 drones already in the air and that is expected to grow to 750,000 by Christmas time. So here's another example of how drones can be used in ag operations. This one controlling a pest in a natural way as well. Check it out. The pink bollworm is a major pest affecting the $100 billion U.S. cotton industry and has practically been eliminated from this country. However, there can be infestation flare-ups and USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service wants to take to the air to control pink bollworm flare-ups. We are investigating using remotely piloted aircraft capable of eliminating small-scale outbreaks as soon as they are detected. The remotely piloted aircraft would release sterile moths into new infestation areas. The sterile moths mate with the wild pink bollworm population and reduce the infestation by preventing offspring. Tests by APHIS this summer showed that remotely piloted aircraft were just as good at releasing the sterile moths as piloted Cessna aircraft. The only difference is that remotely piloted aircraft is more nimble, cost less, as well as effective in suppressing infestations. By the way, pink bollworms affect cotton crops by infesting and feeding on the cotton bowl, damaging the cotton lint, and reducing yield. In Washington for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Also connecting the dots to future careers, Nebraska Extension uses interactive simulations to inform local high school students on career opportunities, and that also includes agriculture. Now, with opportunities like, like today and, and having the opportunity to look at, at careers in agriculture, a lot of people are realizing, hey, it, it is more than just sows, cows, and plows. There's, there's advancements in technology, and, and there's different ways that, that people can get into the career now. This event, called Connect the Dots, was put on by Nebraska Extension at the Buffalo County Fairgrounds there, and it included Kearney High School, Kearney Catholic, as well as other schools in the surrounding area. And of course, there were several messages that they got across. One was the different options when it came to careers and career fields, and also a big take home message. What you do now, the decisions you make can impact you in the future.
Meanwhile, the future didn't look too bright last year for a local pumpkin patch near Gibbon, but now they are open for business. Last year's hailstorm shut down the Carmosta pumpkin patch, and this season, though, the crop has fared well. Here's NTV's John Jankowski. The Carmosta pumpkin patch is back in business. The owner says he's happy to be open again. I feel back to normal like we should have been last year. It just feels good to have everybody come back out and see us. After last year's hailstorm, pumpkins are set to be picked out. One given family took these home. Don't have to travel down the interstate east or west, but uh, to get the kids to go, corn maze and all the stuff that they offer. Cromosta is not even sure how much last year's storm cost him. No, never even, don't look back at it. Yeah, you can't, can't change it. Kids will have the chance to escape a corn maze or play with the animals, something folks in Gibbon missed out on last year. For the community members, like I said, you miss, miss staple items like that in town. New this season is the corn cannon. Just turn her on and... This is an idea Cromosta has had for a couple of years. Finally got around to building it and stuff and just launches the ear of corn and stuff about 100 yards out there and trying to hit the bales of hay. The pumpkin patch is open on Sundays and Saturdays, and on Halloween, they are encouraging you to show up in costume. Up next, we visit a local elevator to see how they handle all that grain at harvest time. Stay with us.